So I want to give a little bit of history um, about our organization. This is the eighth annual meeting. Um, I am very grateful to uh, uh, Jim Esch and Leslie for supporting this and helping us with this and for all of you coming. And I'll explain a little bit about the history and how this became to be. Um, so Codman said uh, that uh, several things that are, I think, quite um, important to our why, our vision. First, he said um, that um, you know the end result. Was, actually, the end result was the first idea of value-based healthcare, more than 100 years ago. And so we are a group committed to recording the end result for every patient, determining the best practices and optimizing outcomes in shoulder surgery, just as Codman envisioned. And you'll see when we, when um, uh, we have the second section of this meeting and Avant Garde Health presents, this has been a fantastic collaboration with an organization that's able to look at enormous data sets, which will tremendously affect the validity of our conclusions about the impact of care. Um, he also said, give me something different for there's a chance of it being better, as um, that is, for me, uh, an entrepreneur speaking, or at least an innovator. He wasn't the greatest entrepreneur, frankly, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, <clears throat> this is our 40th year, and this is a picture of our 30th year in the tribute to Jim Esch, who really should be congratulated for an incredible um, energy to steward the oldest shoulder meeting, I think the oldest shoulder meeting in the world, and Leslie has been a big part of moving this along, and we're indebted to them for creating this organization and for then supporting the Codman Shoulder Society as a component. Um, and um, all of these companies have played a role. Um, there may be some that aren't here. I don't know all the different companies that are here, but this meeting is intended to be a intersection of business and um, uh, orthopedics and academics in the absence of any governor from the standpoint of um, CME. Uh, now, the first Codman Shoulder Society was uh, an attempt to create an alumni group. And it was a relatively small group, and it was uh, kind of interesting. And in fact, there was one before this where Laurent Lafosse came and taught us all in a lab how to do arthroscopic ladder jays and superscapular nerve decompressions and other crazy things that um, now have become more mainstream. And then the second meeting here uh, focused on uh, innovation, and you may notice uh, some uh, individuals in the front row, Steve Burkhart and Steve Snyder and Jim Esch, who talked about what it was like to innovate. And it's important to understand that everything is in the context of the times and the geography. And those were different times when they innovated. They didn't have the same regulatory hurdles that we have. They didn't have the same friction in the system to get things done. And they started this, this uh, um, uh, initiative of innovation, particularly in arthroscopy. And then we had their second meeting, our uh, third meeting, and Mohit Bhandari came and talked about evidence-based medicine, which is something that is foreign to many orthopedic surgeons. And that was a wonderful meeting. You can find all of these on the website. And then Bob Cofield came, and we focused on shoulder arthroplasty and the evolution of shoulder arthroplasty from near onward and, you know, where it's going. And we talked about value, et cetera. And then we had our next meeting, and um, uh, let's see here, a little hard for me to see. And this was about innovation, and Christian Gerber and Gilles Walsh talked about, you know, why do we innovate and how do we get better, which is a, a very profound question, I think, uh, particularly when we're under pressure to just get forward with the next case, et cetera. And I like to joke that sometimes I think the sports medicine doctor's favorite vocabulary word is next um, but you have to slow down and think about things. And one of the things you'll see with Christian Gerber's presentation is that he's an incredible observer. And um, I think it's quite remarkable what, the way he goes about it. Then Bob Kaplan came and talked about um, how to measure outcomes uh, in order to uh, see if we're actually delivering value in what we do. And um, then the last year's meeting was all about digital healthcare and artificial intelligence and robotics and et cetera. That's a big bite of the apple and there's a lot going on there, but I curated individuals including not only industry but startup companies that I think have something to offer um, across the episode of CARE as I'll show you in a moment. Um, so this year, um, you have the program in front of you. This is just an outline of what we're going to do. The first part is going to be about innovation and entrepreneurism. What's the difference? 
you know, um, and uh, what allows these to happen and what's the lens through which you should view this. And then the uh, second portion is going to be a presentation by Avant-Garde Health, and Porter Jones is here, and Derek, Jones will, uh, Derek uh, Haas will join us, will join us uh, through Zoom, and we'll talk about our collaboration and the projects that we've done looking at large data sets. And then the third part is going to be a very important part, which is um, uh, using uh, data based on approach to innovation and collaboration and outcomes and um, uh, our, our uh, esteemed group here is going to uh, consider these, these uh, concepts and uh, Alan Friedman is going to present and then we'll have a conversation about this. And we're, we're not really affected by time so much, I don't want to keep you here longer than you should be, but you may find that you're pretty engaged in this process. Now, I'm going to just start the first session by introducing a little bit about, uh, can we go to the second slide deck, please? I'm having trouble seeing. I've got to move this way a little bit. Is it up? Tell me when you're up. Okay, great. So part one is entitled Innovators, Entrepreneurs, Behavior and Culture. I, I take some license with this because I'm not sure that they're going to talk about behavior and culture, but I am. And I think, you know, there's an expression that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Where you work has a lot to do with what you can actually accomplish. I mean, this is crystal clear. Many of you have already figured this out. So um, Lanny Johnson is going to talk about what's important. Making a difference uh, may include being different. And he is a living, breathing example of what an entrepreneur really could be. And um, these are his own words. Do not take into account a wrong suffered. Do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Do not let your praise come out of your own mouth. Be ambitious for a quiet and peaceful life and follow the golden rule. That's kind of uh, an anachronism nowadays, but it's very profound in my way of thinking. Um, and then Ron Adner uh, is a professor of um, strategy uh, and at uh, Dartmouth Tuck. And he's going to actually do a presentation that's going to be combined. First part is going to be talking about his uh, concept of strategy, uh, which is uh, the wide lens in terms of the way one might innovate. And I would point out here that both Clayton Christensen and Jim Collins commented on this, and they're pretty impactful individuals to be saying this. So I think you're in for a real treat, and I'm thrilled that he is willing to give his time and come speak with us uh, about this concept. Um, so. Just to comment to you a little bit about in the first part here, if you, if you look at innovation on Google, you'll get five trillion results in less than one second. Nobody knows what this means. Everybody has their own idea, here's an example. Uh, but and yet we say, well, I'm innovative, or this person's innovative, or whatever. You can come to your own conclusion in that, we'll see. But we know very little about why one person is more creative than another, but we seem to know who are the best innovators, and they've changed our lives, but most of what they've done is taken for granted, which is another important point here. So look at these individuals, some of, most of whom you may know, some you may not know. It's quite remarkable to realize some of them, like Marie Curie, who not only um, won the Nobel Prize, but won it twice and uh, basically discovered the application of radioactivity. So that, that's what we're up against in terms of we're we gonna call ourselves innovators. Um, if you look in healthcare, about advances over history, you might be surprised to see the vaccines had their beginning in the 1700s. Now, we could all identify with artificial intelligence, that's just coming now. Yet that's been percolating along underneath the cloak of secrecy because of the importance and significance and cost, actually profitability of this. Um, and I can tell you, I get some insight into it because my daughter works for DeepMind Google, but she can't tell me anything about what they do there. Um, but that is going to affect us all in this room significantly and profoundly in the future. Um, you know, Clayton Christensen wrote this book. I never knew him. He had passed away before I went to Harvard Business School. But this, this book and this article in uh, Harvard Business Review was quite profound. And I thought about it a bit. And I wanted to share part of it with you. It was entitled The Innovator's DNA. What does that mean? Are people born innovators? Well, the answer is clearly no. Um, you know, the question is, who do you, how do you identify someone who has the potential to innovate and potentially disrupt? And he points out that each year, 50 million new businesses start. It's, it's the lifeblood of the global economy. His methodology that he used to try to identify what are the aspects, what are the character traits of an innovator involved analysis of 2,500 innovators and 15,000 executives in 75 countries. Now, three of these people that you would all agree is an, are innovators are here. 
And what he found out is that this is not a genetic trait, but modifiable in your behaviors. Um, nurture trumps nature in this instance. Everybody has the potential to do this by the way they approach things. And I have some people here, I believe, that fit this, this uh, definition. And um, there are five key behaviors. They're very, very interesting. Number one, questioning to puncture the status quo. Don't just question superficially, but exhaustively. Number two, observe with an intensity beyond the ordinary. This is what Dr. Gerber does all the time, and the reason he's had such a big impact. Network to create diverse connections. That's a very, very powerful force. Experimentation, which is central to innovation. Now, we're discouraged from experimentation. Even though we every day innovate in our operating room with our patients, you know, we are governed by the relative risk of trying new things. Bassam does this all the time with great success. And what he does leads to innovations that take a while to come into the literature, but certainly he's ahead of his time in innovating surgery, and Gerber did the same throughout his entire career. Uh, and then associative thinking, which is one of the most powerful forces, taking something from over here and putting it with something over there and creating something new. Most of us, as we become specialists, get a narrower view of the world. And what I found when I went to business school, particularly because I went to a school where I wasn't focused on healthcare, was the broader view which allowed me to look for what worked in other areas that might be transportable to healthcare and make a difference in our world. But we don't see these things because we only talk to each other. We don't, we don't talk to people that might be examples for us to use. I asked the Codman Shoulder Society membership to rank the top innovations in the last 50 years. You can see them here. And of course, number one, not surprisingly, is reverse shoulder replacement. Um, and you know, this was published as an op-ed in the book by uh, Rockwood and Mattson. Um, it's interesting because when you ask people to say what they think, I would quote Ozan, Ozan Varal, who wrote a book, Think Like a Rocket Scientist, which is a wonderful book. He said, our tendency toward skewed judgment partially results from our confirmation bias. We undervalue evidence that contradicts our beliefs and overvalue evidence that confirms them. This happens at every meeting we go to. And when you listen to people speak and their voice goes higher, it is a correlation to the lack of evidence usually associated with what they're talking about, in my opinion. The next part is that if we innovate, can we scale? And we cannot do this without industry, in my opinion. And you can innovate for yourself and create fantastic things that cure people. And it may well be that you can't scale that. You have to produce others that can do the same thing if you're going to have an impact. And if it's all about just you, it's just a novel thing. And this is, this is a book that talks about this that m most people in business read. But you know, it's interesting because this is all about a novel idea, something you have to have to, how do you make it easier to adopt it? And it has to do with value. And again, we'll talk about the value proposition for things as well. So back to the question of where we, where we innovate. If you look at large organizations, and this is out of Christensen book, um, it, it, they tend to be organizations where top management teams are selected for their delivery skills, not disruptive skills. Uh, and, you know, established firms do well with incremental innovations. I believe this to be the case, and actually I'm doing a study on culture with some colleagues at Harvard Business School to see if that's the case. We've done some preliminary work on that. Smaller organizations tend to be leaders selected based on disruptive skills that know how to think differently, and smaller forms do better with radical changes. That's just my sense. I don't know if that's totally true, but if you look at that list I just showed you, most of those innovations came outside of mainstream academia. Um, and that's, you know, that's just a fact. So I borrowed the slide, I think I borrowed the slide from Christian Gerber, I really like this statement. There is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come, and uh, that's the definition of scaling and innovation, or at least an in innovation anyway. So thank you, that's the introduction.